All right, uh, today's message is so positive, so, so joyful. It actually is, but some of you are going to wonder how we're going to get there because the, today's message is called The Truth About Repentance. And look at what just happened. <laughs> I will tell you that repentance really is the key to joy. We'll get to that here in just a minute. But we're going through the life of David, and we are learning life lessons from David. And last week, we looked at 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, and we talked about the truth about sin and from David's story. Uh, remember, he sends his army to battle. He's the king, obviously. He stays behind in Jerusalem. One night, he sees Bathsheba bathing. Uh, she is the wife of Uriah. David sins for her, commits adultery with her. She becomes pregnant. To commit, to cover his sin, David brings Uriah back from battle, hoping he'll sleep with his wife and think the child is his. How many know you don't need to watch TV when you can read the Bible? Okay? So when Uriah refuses out of loyalty to his fellow soldiers to sleep with his wife, David orders him to be placed in the front lines of battle where Uriah is killed. And afterward, David marries Bathsheba. About a year passes, uh, Nathan, the prophet, uh, kind of like the nation's pastor, comes to David, and you remember he tells a story to David. He goes, I want to tell you a story about a guy who was very rich. He owned a bunch of sheep, and there was one guy who was really poor. He only owned one sheep, and the guy who was very rich needed a sheep. Instead of taking one his own, he took one from the poor man and David, and all of his self-righteousness said, that guy should die. And Nathan the prophet, perhaps the most powerful short sermon in the history of the world, said, David, you are that man. And Nathan calls out David in his sin. David responds with repentance, and he says, I have sinned. And Nathan says, the Lord forgives you, but there are going to be some consequences for your sin. So in response to all of these events in David's life, he writes Psalm 51. And let me remind you that David wrote 73 of the Psalms in the book of Psalms, and this is one of them. So Psalm 51 is a psalm, a song that David writes, uh, and it's really a picture of his repentance after he's confronted by Nathan. So I'm gonna encourage you to stand, if you would, and we're gonna read Psalm 51 together. Let's read it together. Have mercy on me, O God according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in the burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Thank you. You can, be, you can be seated. 
you might be asking, what does this prayer of repentance have to do with me, Pastor Wayne? I didn't commit adultery. I've never killed anybody. Well, I hope that's true. But the truth is, all of us need to learn how to repent. Because all of us, the Bible says, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Some of us may not need to repent for murder or adultery, but we need to repent for gossip, unforgiveness, lust, selfishness, sexual activity outside of marriage, drunkenness. Do I keep going? Say, yeah, pastor, just don't get to mine, all right? (laughs) The reality is, we all need to learn how to repent. And if I could encourage you, this is an important message. Every, every Sunday is important. I, I totally get that. But I think this might be a big missing piece, particularly from the American church. Because I'm not sure we know how to repent. And today, David is going to show us in Psalm 51 what biblical repentance looks like. And I think it's incredibly important. And so this message, it's going to be a little heavy, and, and that's okay. But I want to encourage you, it's good news. Uh, because when we, we learn how to repent, we on the other side of repentance is joy and life and fellowship with God. All right? So you got to hang around to the end. Okay? Now, when it comes to the word repent, what does it mean? You might see the, you might be driving down the road on a billboard and there's just one word, repent. Okay, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, David's going to show us how to repent today and we're going to learn and it's going to change our lives. I'm prophesying, somebody say amen. amen. Would you write this down if you can follow along? All right, number one, I think what David shows us in Psalm 51 is that repentance expresses personal sorrow for sin. I think too many times when we sin, we're sorry, but really we're sorry we got caught. We're sorry because of the consequences of our actions. We're sorry because we don't want to go to hell. We're sorry because we don't want to end up in divorce. We're sorry because we don't want to destroy a relationship with our kids. Those kinds of reasons for saying sorry are never going to result in repentance. I want you to notice that David here is focused on the fact that he is, he's not just sorry that he did it, he's sorry because he has grieved the heart of God. He has trampled on the heart and the grace of a loving, patient God. Because David knows, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be king. If David, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have killed Goliath. If it wasn't for God, I would never have been anointed. Come on, somebody. David recognized that everything good in his life came from God. And what did he do with it? He threw it away. Look at what he says in verse 4. He says, God against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I know know we might read this and say, really, David? Against God only have you sinned? What about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? You know, uh, that's wicked behavior. What David did is wicked behavior. But I think what David is saying, yes, I understand all of this is wicked behavior. But if it's wicked toward men, how wicked must sin be toward God? David realized he personally offended God, broke his trust, betrayed his generosity. And David feels the sorrow, godly sorrow, of understanding that I haven't just hurt other people. I've actually taken the grace of God and trampled it underfoot. And he expresses the sorrow of that. And can I tell you that without that, the rest is going to be difficult, the rest of repentance, because the ultimate goal of repentance is a change of heart, mind, and direction. 
And if it doesn't begin in the heart, it's going to be hard to change your mind, and it's going to be really hard to change your behavior. Come on, somebody. David shows us that repentance begins in a restoration of a relationship with God. Number two, David shows us that repentance accepts the responsibility for sin. When the prophet Nathan comes to David and says, tells him this story, and you are the man, David responds to Nathan this way. Would you, would you say 2 Samuel 12, verse 13 out loud with me? I have sinned against the Lord. Now stop right there. I, we just learned how to repent. The first part of repentance is I have sinned against the Lord. And the key word there is I have sinned. There's no mention, by the way, in Psalm 51 of Uriah. You know, if he had just gone to sleep with his wife, he'd still be alive. There's no word about why Bathsheba was bathing naked on the rooftop for David to see. In fact, she's not mentioned at all. David says in verse 3, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. See that David's not blaming other people for his sin. He's taking personal responsibility. He says, my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And, and, and compare that with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they uh, are caught in sin, Adam says, the woman you gave me. And Eve says, the serpent. It was this. There's this blame game that's, it comes with our sin nature that we want to blame other people for our sin. And, and let's be honest, we do that too. You know, I did that, but he did that to me. I know I'm addicted, but these other people emotionally beat me up. I know my anger got out of control, but you should have seen the way my dad treated me when I was growing up. I'm sorry for what I did, but I was angry. I'm sorry for what I did, but I was tired. How I many know you're just making excuses? I'm sorry, but I'm only human. Here's what's wrong with that. That kind of thinking and that kind of reasoning will never lead to life change. And the purpose of repentance is changing your behavior. And if you are constantly blaming other people for your problems, this is, let's sit right here for a second, okay? This is a huge issue in our culture, in our nation, in our world. We don't take personal responsibility for our own actions. It's somebody else's fault. It's this, it's this. And we make all kinds of excuses. And David shows us it's my sin. It's my transgression, God. I did it. He says, say it with me again, I have sinned. Were there factors that influence your choice to sin? It's possible others may have indeed wronged you first. You may have been greatly affected by the home you grew up in. You may have felt extreme pressure from other people to do what you did, but at the end of the day, your sin was your choice. You decided you on your own. So it's your responsibility to take responsibility for your own sin. Without it, it's not true repentance. David, David shows us third, repentance accepts the consequences of sin. Nathan, the prophet, confronts David. David says, I have sinned. Nathan goes on to say, there's some consequences for your action. Verse 10 of 2 Samuel 12, the sword will never leave your house. Now, we addressed this last week in the message, but the reality is there is a difference between forgiveness of sin and consequences for sin. And again, I think this is where we might struggle because did God forgive David? Yes, he did. Nathan says the Lord has, you're not gonna die. The Lord's gonna forgive your sin. But were there consequences for David and his family for the rest of his life? Yes. One of the books I read preparing for this journey through the life of David is by Mark Rutland, and the book is called David the Great, this quote about sin. Listen, he says, you can repent of sin and be forgiven, but you may not always be able to alter the outcome. A naughty little boy can pick up a rock and think how fun it would be to shatter a window with it, Immediately after he throws the rock, he thinks, oh no, God, I'm sorry. Does God forgive him? Of course. Is God going to stop that rock in midair and drop it safely to the ground? Unlikely. 
Nathan said to David in 2 Samuel 12, the Lord has taken away your sin. Nathan replied, you won't die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you've shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord, this son born to you will surely die. The Lord has taken your sin away. How many know that's good news? If we confess our sin, 1 John 1, 9 says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. That's awesome. However, if we confess our sin, does that mean that God is gonna take away all the consequences of our sin? Not necessarily. Nathan says, David, there's gonna be some consequences for your actions. Did David reply, God, that's not fair. I said I was sorry. I thought you were gonna forgive me, God. I mean, no, he sounds like an American Christian. David responds, verse four, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. I think too often we approach repentance as a get out of hell free card. We only repent because we don't want bad things to happen to us. And we definitely don't want the consequences of our sin. But if God forgave us of our sin and bailed us out of all of the consequences of our choices, he wouldn't be a loving God. What if a parent consistently excused the bad behavior of a child, never punished them, never enforced the consequences of the wrong behavior of that child? Does that parent love that child? No, the Bible says you actually hate that child. Because what's going to happen to a child like that? They're going to grow up and they're going to be destructive to themselves and to other people. This is, this is hard for us to hear as American Christians, but the reality is when God allows the consequences of sin to take effect in our lives, it's actually because he loves us. You're not going to hear this on too many radio stations, but it's God's word. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens, which is another word for punishes, everyone who accepts his son. So if I could speak to any kids in the room or students in the room, can I encourage you when your parents correct you and punish you because you did stupid stuff, don't be an emotional terrorist to them to hate you. I wish I was never born. I wish I had other parents. You were blah, 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 blah. Don't do that. If, if you, if you want to be a godly young person, go ahead and receive it and, and accept the correction. I realize this is a big ask in this culture, but the reality is if your parents are correcting you, it's because they love you. And you should be grateful because we're living in a culture where parents are discouraged from correcting their kids. Good preaching, Pastor Wayne. You're welcome. Number four, I think David shows us in Psalm 51 that repentance is turning to God and turning from sin. Repentance is turning to God, but it's also turning from sin. Verse two, David prays, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David's prayer is, God, change me. Don't just change me on the outside. Change me on the inside. David turns to God and says, God, what I need is you. I need you to help me to hate what you hate. I need, to help you, I need you to help me to love what you love. I want to be different. I want to change. Can I tell you that repentance is not just about behavior modification. It's an inward change of your heart. And when your heart changes, your thinking changes, and your behavior changes. What is repentance? Every junior Bible quizzer in our church, and there's more than 40 of them this year, go, Bible, go JBQers, Every one of them know the answer to this 10-point question, what does the word repentance mean? And the answer is, repentance is a change of heart, mind, and direction. And 
I think it's in that order. David turns to God. God created me a clean heart. The apostle Paul describes repentance this way in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. He says, the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin. Repentance, Paul is saying, leads us away from sin. Are you still with me? If you say you're sorry and you have no plan to avoid that sin in the future, no plan to cut off the relationships or the sources that continue to influence you to choose sin, no plan to change the way you live, to change the way you act, to change the way you believe, then is that really repentance? The answer is no. Repentance is more than just saying I'm sorry. Repentance is recognizing that I'm a sinner. David says, in sin my mother conceived me. I have a bent toward sin. So God, I need you to change my heart. I come to you, I turn to God and I turn away from sin. Are you getting this? I think the American church has separated uh, repentance, well, let me, let, me, let me quote Tertullian. He was a church father from years ago. He says, if you attempt to have Jesus without repentance, you'll end up with religion without heaven. I'll make you shake a little bit. True repentance is willingness to change your heart and your behavior. True repentance might mean for some that you go see a counselor, that you go to rehab, that you ask your small group or friends to hold you accountable, to give you oversight or accountability. True repentance starts in the heart, but it leads to changed behavior. Amen? Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, David modeled it for us here. But what he also shows us in Psalm 51 are the results of repentance. If we embrace biblical repentance, some pretty amazing things happen in our lives. The first thing is joy. When we repent of sin, God restores our joy. Psalm 51 verse 12, David says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I think sometimes when we think about that year, in David's life between when he committed the sin with Bathsheba, covered it up by having Uriah killed, there was about a year passed before Nathan the prophet confronts him about that sin. I think sometimes we mistakenly think that David, you know, spent his time like, hey, I'm cool, you know, got away with it, it's awesome. No, I think, I think we're missing it. Because remember, the scripture says, David was a man after God's own heart. So I, I think it's probably more like David couldn't sleep at night, that there's something gnawing at his spirit, this heaviness, this conviction, this, this twinge. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I think that's what David uh, was saying here. And when he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation, I think what David is saying, God, I haven't felt your joy in a long time. And the reason is because of unconfessed unrepentant sin. Can I tell you that the key to joy is repentance? Where's the joy in the house of the Lord? We sing the song, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house. Nice song. It's a great song, Pastor Zach. That's awesome. We're in agreement. But the reality is, where is the joy in the house of the Lord? Where is the joy in the people of God? Why is there... Such a spirit of heaven is. Listen, I know, I know darkness is, is, is coming on strong, and I know we're racing toward the end, but can I tell you part of the reason is because we're not taking repentance very seriously. And there's far too many of us that are playing with sin. We are, we are tolerating sin. We're not taking it very seriously, and as a result, there's this heaviness on us because our hands are kind of tied together. And because our hearts are kind of weighed down because of unconfessed sin and unrepentant sin in our life. Can I tell you that, that unconfessed sin and unrepentant sin will suck the joy right out of you? 
right? And so David says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Can I tell you one of the reasons we need to repent is so that we can experience the joy of the Lord again? Amen. Amen. Second result of repentance is brokenness. Verse eight, he says, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. I think one of the things that happens to us when we repent, the result is brokenness or true humility. Last night, Tracy and I participated in a fundraiser for Friends Fellowship of Indiana. It's a ministry to the women's prisons here in central Indiana, and it's led by Roe Ferris from our church and, and some other ladies. A lot of them are from our church. And last night at this fundraiser, uh, Roe had a lady share her story and Years ago, many years ago, she was put in jail for a crime. She didn't say what the crime was. She simply described it as unforgivable. She was sentenced to 50 plus years in prison. And Roe has been doing this for a long time. So she was talking about years ago, uh, this lady who was incarcerated says, hey, Roe came with her team. They led us through classes on healing damaged emotions led us through Bible studies, brought us gloves and things that we needed to help us along, and she gave her heart to the Lord, and uh, just last year, got out of prison, and which we thank God for, but the reason I'm telling you this is because as she was sharing that story last night, there was a brokenness, a humility that was so clear in her life. She, she was, her heart was, I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve grace, but God gave me grace. I didn't deserve mercy, but God, I deserve to die. I, she was saying, I own this. But can I tell you that when we are truly repentant, the result is not spiritual pride. The result is the opposite. We actually embrace brokenness and humility. And that's what God wants for us, to be broken. True repentance results in humility. Two more. I think repentance results in fellowship with God. David prays in verse 11, he says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Did you read that right? David says, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Why would David say that? Because David knew that sin separates us from God. The most important thing to David was the presence of God, friendship with God, the anointing of God, and he never wanted to leave without it. And so David says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Imagine it this way. Imagine you're in a room. It's very cold outside. You're, you're in a house. It's a cold winter day. The air is frigid outside. The sun is shining through the window. It starts to warm you up and you bask in its glow. But then you pull the drape closed and instantly the warmth stops. Is it because the sun has stopped shining? No. It's because something has come between you and the sun. The moment you open the drape, the sun can warm you again. But it's up to you. The barrier is inside the house, not outside. Sin has a way of separating us from God. And all of a sudden, we can't feel his presence. We don't feel his joy. We don't experience the life that we're supposed to have walking with Jesus Christ. Whatever that barrier between you and him is, you gotta move that out of the way through repentance. And by the way, the Bible does warn that people who persist in sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can I be super transparent with you? We live in a community, we listen to a lot of worship songs where there is a a thought of once you're saved, you're always saved. I'm sorry, I don't see that in the Bible. Pastor, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to speak the truth to you. Because when Jesus says to the people, he says, there's gonna be some people I'm gonna say depart, or I'm gonna separate you on my left and on my right, and he's gonna say to some of them, depart from them, I never 
knew you. There's a, there, the reality is, and I know this is heavy, but it's got to be said, the reality is there are some people who think they're saved and they're not. There's, there's people who think they're going to heaven and they're not. And can I tell you, one, I'm not God and I don't get to be the judge. Only God knows. But I think part of it is we've, we've embraced this idea that somehow we can just continue in sin and God's okay with it. Oh, God understands. We're all sinners. Paul said, should we continue in sin? No. We're supposed to repent. We're supposed to be like David. We're supposed to come to him with a broken heart and humility. And he cleanses us and he restores fellowship with God. Can I give you one more? Please, Pastor, give you one more. The result of repentance is a testimony. The result of repenting is a story. Psalm 51, verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Part of David's repentance, he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He goes, and he says, I'm gonna teach transgressors your ways, God. Now, how does David do this? How is David going to teach other sinners the ways of God? David uses his gift, his gift of music, his gift of writing, and he writes a song about repentance. It's called Psalm 51, and we just read it. I I want you to imagine David writing Psalm 51, This is after all of this goes down. He's repentant and he cries out before the Lord. He he responds the right way. And here he has these scrolls in his hand. Or maybe it's just one parchment, we don't know. And I'm I'm just conjecturing here, but maybe David goes to the director of music. You know how sometimes when you read Psalms, the first part, it says to the director of music or the sons of Korah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you read a paper Bible, it has those headers. So this one says on Psalm 51, to the director of music after Nathan confronts David about his sin with Bathsheba. (laughs) So imagine with me, David takes this letter, this psalm, and he goes to the director of music and he says, uh, hey, choir director, I've just written a new song and I want you to get the choir together and after you've learned this song, Uh, I want you to get a huge crowd together, and we're going to sing it for everyone. Okay, David, you're a good songwriter. Let's take a look at it. So he starts to look at it. He reads the words, Psalm 51, that David's written down. He looks up at the king in bewilderment, and he says, "Uh, Your majesty, we can't sing this. Everybody's going to know what it's about. God's forgiven you. We've all been willing to forget it. Can't we do that? Can't we just forget it? Nobody's talking about Uriah anymore. Bathsheba's your wife. You've got a beautiful baby now. Can't we just leave all of this behind? David says, no. You're gonna sing this song. You're gonna sing it every time I tell you to sing it. And when I'm dead and gone, I want you to keep singing it. I want my sin memorialized forever so that everyone will know what I did. But more importantly, they're gonna know of my repentance and the grace that God poured out on me despite my wicked sin. Can I tell you that 3,000 years later, we're still reading David's psalm. And he's still teaching us how to repent. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that whatever you've been through, whatever you've done, who, whatever law you've broken, whatever wicked thing you've ever committed. There may be consequences for that in this life that we can do nothing about, but the reality is God can forgive you of your sin. There's a reason why we name the church Grace, because it's not just a cool church name. It's our story, it's our testimony, it's our message. I'm looking across the room, and the reality is I don't know everything about you, 
I don't know your life. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. I don't, I don't know. But there is one who does. His name is God, and he loves you. And get this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. By far, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. While I was a sinner, Christ died for me. You want to know why I repent of my sin? You want to know why I confess my sin, accept responsibility for my sin, accept the consequences of sin? Because I know that there is a God who didn't hold anything back. He gave his son so that I could be his son, his daughter in the faith. Would you bow your head? Close your eyes. All over this room, I'm gonna ask that no one be moving around and just honor this very sacred moment. Would you listen closely? Because the Holy Spirit is working. For some of you, the truth is, you're far from God. The truth is, there's sin in your life. And it's unrepentant sin. The reality is, you're not following God. You're kind of doing your own thing. You say, Pastor, I just came here because my kids wanted some candy. No, you came here because God wanted you to hear the truth. And the truth will set you free. And I'm not asking you here today to join this church. I'm not asking you here to sign a card. I'm asking you, is your heart right with God? Because if it's not, today is your day to not just pray a prayer, to not just say some words, but to say, God, create in me a pure heart, oh God. Grieve over your sin. More than just I'm sorry, God, give me godly sorrow for my sin. I fully and completely submit to you, and I completely confess there is nothing good that I have done to earn anything good that you've done for me but Lord, I know that you gave me Jesus and it's not a fair exchange, but Lord, out of humble gratitude, I receive mercy, forgiveness. No matter what you've done, no matter who you've hurt, no matter where you've been, seeing pastor, I can get right with God, yes. Pastor, I can be part of God's family, yes. Pastor, I can, I can go to heaven, yes. Not because you're good, but because God is good. Oh man, not because you're awesome, but because God is awesome and he loves you. And he's loved the world. He loved you so much, he gave his only son. And the truth is he loved you so much, he brought you here today. You're not here by accident to hear this message because he is ready to change your life, your future your eternity. He is ready to break the power of sin off of your life. That's what he did at the cross. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm just being honest. The Holy Spirit's speaking to me. I don't think I'm right with God or I'm not sure. And today I want to be sure. I want to give you an opportunity to do exactly what we've been preaching about. I want to give you an opportunity to repent. If that's you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. I need to make things right with God. I want you to raise your hand as high as you can right now. Raise it, raise it, raise it. Come on, raise it all over this room. All over this room. Many, many hands. Keep raising them. Come on, keep raising them. I want to make things right with God. I want to know that my heart is right with God. Keep raising them. Keep raising them. I'm estimating 25, 30, even more. Come on, keep raising them. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. Thank you for convicting me of sin. I want to make things right with God. You can put your hands down. I want to invite you to stand. Please stand if you would. Invite our prayer team to the front. Can you, can you do this for me? Everybody who just raised your hand I believe that by raising your hand, you mean business with God. And here's what I wanted you to do. In just a moment, we're gonna sing a song. 
And I want you to come and find one of these prayer team leaders. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna pray with you. They're gonna pray with you, okay? And prayer team leaders, I want you to look at me for a second, all right? Uh, you're gonna lead them to the Lord, okay? Give them a chance to pray, cry out to God, but then you're gonna lead them to the Lord, okay? All right? you're gonna do that, all right? I wanna encourage you to do that. So we're gonna sing this chorus. Many hands were raised. As soon as we sing the first words of the song, nobody's leaving because this is a holy moment, right? Nobody's, nobody's in a hurry because we recognize this is the most important thing in the whole world right now. Lost people coming to Jesus. If you raised your hand, I want you to come and find one of these prayer team members right now. Go ahead and step.